Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How are you? This is Eddie Marcus. Again, Sunday night, I think it's the 19th, getting ready to go to bed. I got these thoughts that's on my mind. And it's noteworthy. I want to share it with you. I got my subject matter is always a snake at the door. Always a snake at the door. Let that rattle around in your mind just for a second. Always a snake at the door. I'm drawn to this conversation that we're all having that's relative to the Trumpism. And I'm thinking about the people who have engaged themselves, indulged in their business of whatever Donald Trump is in, you know, whether it were lawyers or accountants or business associates or whatever. Uh, and Donald Trump has been able to manipulate them in and out of court and in and out of deals and still existing as uh, the people believing he's all of this and all of that. And I was watching him on the debate, the 2020 debate with Joe Biden and the way he ran his mouth. I'm seeing that uh, in those cases, the people would just allow Donald Trump to win just to get him to shut up. I mean, the man got a, a mouth. He got a moat on him. <laughs> so uh, that's not a bad thing. In fact, it's gotten him as far as it has gotten him. And if this is where he's going to go, then he's okay. But now we're talking about a snake at the door. What kind of person? Well, first of all, what does a snake represent? First of all, you probably not going to see him. Sneak up on you. Right? You chilling, and before you know it, how many of you ever been out in the grass somewhere just chilling out, and all of a sudden a snake just run across you? Sometimes people say if he didn't bother, he was a king snake. You know, they come up with some kind of reason. Snake didn't fear you. You weren't intimidated, or if you were, you were able to contain it. So the snake goes on by his way. But nevertheless, a snake at the door has something on his mind. A snake at the door has something on his mind. So let's see. Let's look at that. A snake at the door got something on his mind. Let's look at uh, there are two people uh, that's uh, in the Congress that I believe they're senators. That one is called um, Senator Manchin. I believe he's a Democrat. And uh, Senator Sinema. I believe he's a Democrat as well. Now, we know that the Republicans are not concerned about the, cause the, 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 the ups and downs of the poor. Not at all. You know, their hope is that, uh, that they could build back better. But the Republicans are not concerned about that at all. Now, all of a sudden, you get a, a chance to at least reach out to the people, a nation of people, at least 48 states, and then 50 states of people who are going through a certain kind of pain, a certain kind of suffering. And you got this political power that says we're going to commit ourselves to help you get along. You know, we're not going to help you get it right, but we're going to help you build back better. We've suffered some stuff, and many of you have gone through some changes, and we can stretch out as others have materialized and went multi-billions and millions of dollars and going up in space, playing around, floating in space, and coming on back down, and you can't even pay your bill, can't put gas in your car. So when you're thinking about this, my friends, when you're thinking about this, and here are two, two senators who says, we're going to join with the Republicans and say no to the poor. No to those who are struggling. Yes, we just said to the military. Yes, we just said in taxation to help the rich. We said that, but now you, the poor, those of you who are living from paycheck to paycheck, or those of you who just got no check, oh, well, you know, what casualties of war. Well, so it appears that Sinema and Manchin have joined with the Republicans. And remember, Democrats, they are Democrats. 
These are people who have come to Washington to say we're going to represent our constituents. Now, our constituents go beyond the state that we're in. If we are Democrats, if we are Republicans, our con constituency goes across the board. So in those situations where we have given our best support to our constituents, our immediate constituents, and our broader constituency is calling on us to act in a political, democratic form, what are we going to do? We're going to do what we're going to do. And we're going to come out as a full pledged democratic situation. And if we don't do that, then we join with those that don't care. So that must be called out. So now, I want to ask you. Now, the pain and suffering that you know that's going to generate to many of you. What you might have been expecting, you were thanking God for, hoping it came through. You went to the polls and voted for Joe Biden and all of those that said they were that way, progressive. Now you're looking forward and you find out not only is the opposite party fighting against you, but those in your party Whew. fighting against you. Now, when you look at those faces, what do you see? I'm sure you see um, a different team, but the same identical game. You see, there's a gentleman back who tried to stack the United States government with crooks that would be loyal to him. Not to the nation, not to the people, not to the Constitution, but to him. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? At least a, a, a population of about 330, maybe so million people. At least seven to four million people that were able to vote agreed with that. I mean, they were willing to vote, saying, yes, we stand with racism. We stand with hatred. We stand with bigotry. We stand with these uh, our streets. And not only that, they're making plans to solidify this and implement it and have some effect on the nation by doing well. You see what has happened, ladies and gentlemen? This is a party of people that have even said that second-class citizen is all right for those of you we have treated as second-class citizen. Why? Because we are superior. Now, yes, this is what is being said. This is what being said. If justice is not being rendered, if justice is not what we are seeking, if fairness is not what we're seeking, then we are seeking some which we call superiority, white supremacy. Now, when I say white supremacy, I don't want you to think, I want to get this clear. I'm saying white supremacy here in America. You know, it is an evil thing, but America does not have a hold on evil. It's everywhere. In China, evil is there. It ain't no white man, it's a Chinese. In certain parts of Africa, the same kind of pain and suffering is going on. It ain't no white man, it's a black man. And anywhere in the world where people say they're different, there's pain and suffering going on and there's a man there and he ain't white and he ain't black and he ain't that, but he's some color. So what am I saying? Anybody ain't got to do with color in America White people have been taught. Black people have been taught. But they're supposed to be a power, an awakening power, to inform you about a snake at the door. You see, the problem that we have I think about it. I'm thinking about those Republicans that throw you under the bus. Let's say you don't matter. We don't have time for you. K 
casualties of war. And then you think about the Democrats. They're not qualified, it seems at least, to take you where you need to go trying to stay on the same plan of normality. No, my friends, in order to fight evil in this death, you've got to be willing to take the people to a place where they have never, ever been, where money is no problem. Still, still, I must say to you, the people, listen to me good, in America, Russia, China, North Korea, Philippines, the people get what they deserve. If any people are being abused and don't know it, they will continue. But if it is discovered that that abuse exists, courage will find someone to resist it. This is the emergence of freedom. Or resist and don't. And you're a slave forever. 400 years? Wow. When are you going to wake up? Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say freedom for you rests in your hands. How much are you willing to pay for it? If you're not willing to give your life, you don't deserve it. And when I speak, speaking of your life, I'm saying that what is righteous for you is righteous for all. And when you spend your life for anything, you're spending it for all. You are the key. So, freedom for the natives. Who, who is the freedom for? <laughs> it's freedom, seriously. For the blacks. Who, was, who are slaves, who still are slaves. Who was the freedom for? Answer these questions. And do you feel free? And are you willing to pay the price for freedom if you don't feel free? You can't be led, ladies and gentlemen. Moses tried it. It didn't work. Jesus tried it. It didn't work. Dr. King tried it, it didn't work. Gandhi tried it, it didn't work. You can't be following people. You must be following the spirit of the living God. You can't see God, no one can see God. But God can be expressed in your life and God can be reflected in your activities. And we can see God. And the God that you present can lead us out of this darkness or play a role in it because all of us got a part in freedom. All of us got a part in life. And all of us matter. Why? Because God matters. And it takes all of us to represent God, to see the fullness of God. Now, I didn't mean to preach to you, but I can't get away from it. The answer is an invisible power living in you that can show love greater than anybody else. And everybody jump on and say, ooh, where you get that from? I want some. And you say, look up inside. And it's there I am waiting for you to wake up. And there you are, ready. And we together are running free. Bye-bye.